It's actually a pretty convenient day to have this con this uh, this workshop because, uh, as we'll get to in a little bit in the, uh, at the end of our our, our panelists, is Congress is is today voting to undermine efforts to uh, provide clarity on the Clean Water Act. And we'll get into that. So this couldn't be at a better time to really discuss this issue um, and, 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 and figure out ways that you guys can help and get you guys some information that'll help you in your uh, everyday lives as you go back to your organizations. Um, so with that, a little bit of background before we go into our introduce our panelists. Um, th there is a proposed rule out there by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Corps of Engineers that's really simple. If you just break it down in the simplest terms, it essentially clearly defines which streams and wild wetlands would be protected under the 1972 Clean Water Act. So if you remember, if you take yourself back a couple years ago, uh, well, I would say almost yeah. almost 15 yeah. plus years yeah. ago, uh, two controversial Supreme Court decisions um, or opinions have left it unclear um, if our nation's landmark water law applies to smaller streams and wetlands. So what that means is the status of roughly over two million acres of stream, two million miles of streams, and millions of acres of wetlands that are in, were intended to be protected under the Clean Water Act uh, are hanging in the balance. So what we're going to discuss today is a little bit about the science of why headwater streams uh, are, are are need the protection under the Clean Water Act, why wetlands. Um, need a protection of the Clean Water Act, and what are some of the things that we can do together as uh, your individual groups and as um, organizations can uh, advocate to the key decision makers, namely Congress, basically to stay out of the way and let EPA do its job um, and promulgate this rule. So um, with that, um, I have uh, will take time to introduce our panelists. I'll do one at a time, and then we can I'll introduce the next one. So the first we have Brian Burroughs, Dr. Brian Burroughs. He is the current um, executive director of Michigan Trout Unlimited. And before that, he is a proud Spartan. Uh, he has his PhD from uh, Michigan State University um, in fisheries uh, science. So he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of the Clean Water Act on headwater streams. So Brian, I'm going to pull up his... Uh, Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to have you here. Everybody seems to be awake for uh, late in the afternoon. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much for being awake. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, Brian Burroughs. I work for Trout Unlimited. And so some of what I'll talk about today will definitely have the cold water fish flavor to it. Uh, it's not that uh, all the other species of fish are unimportant, they're wonderful, uh, but the Great Lakes region has an absolute ton of fish diversity and quality fisheries, so I thought I would, uh, uh, out of necessity, focus in a little bit of what I will speak about uh, on cold water fish. Here's a, a, some pictures or photos of several of the sort of premier cold water fish of the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes regions, and these are uh, specifically ones that require the use of stream habitats uh, at least some part of their life cycles so you can see that the uh, upper left hand corner is a picture of a rainbow trout or a steelhead uh, they spend the first two years of their life uh, in in river systems they can vary from one to three years but usually it's two years in a river uh, and their adults return there to spawn and, and go all the way up river systems when we allow them to um, Below that is a brown trout. Uh, that actually is a world record brown trout uh, that uh, grew up in Lake Michigan and was caught in uh, a river system in Michigan a few years back. Um, brown trout usually spend most of, or I should say the majority of brown trout spend most of their life in stream systems, but there are these uh, migratory uh, uh, Great Lakes uh, run brown trout and they do get big. I know uh, Wisconsin and Illinois have their fair share of uh, very big brown trout as well. Uh, pink salmon, uh, less, lesser, lesser in abundance in the Great Lakes. Below that uh, is the Atlantic salmon there in the mid right hand side. Uh, those two are not as common but they, they are around uh, and provide important fisheries in parts of Lake Superior and Lake Huron. Uh, below that is a picture of a Chinook. We also have Chinook and Coho salmon. Again, uh, these Chinook don't spend a lot of their lives in river systems, but they do absolutely depend upon them for spawning, and they spend about the first, oh, maybe six months or so in river systems before migrating out to the Great Lakes. 
Then of course in the middle is uh, one of the most beautiful fish that there is, brook mm -hmm. trout. And um, again, you know, by and large, most of those spend their entire lives in, in rivers and stream systems. The Great Lakes is blessed to have uh, some uh, subset or special, special uh, populations of them that are called coasters that migrate to and from Great Lakes waters into river systems. But out of all of these fish species, brook trout are probably perhaps, you know, the most specifically and well suited to headwater systems, tiny very cold small river systems and that's kind of what we're talking about here you don't have to read all that you can if you want i'll summarize it's basically to say that these cold water fish are are pretty much a canary in a coal mine um, they are certainly uh, some of the most enjoyed and utilized by anglers they contribute to a lot of uh, uh, great lakes tourism economy around the state both inland and great lakes waters but they're also, um, you know, frankly, some of the weaker fish. They're very intolerant of, of degradation and all types of degradation. Almost anything we do ends up having a negative impact on these fish. They have to have cold, uh, well oxygenated water and they have to have a diversity of habitats. And the way that uh, they normally get that is to be able to access all portions of a watershed to find shallow spawning gravel, to find juvenile habitat, to find larger, deeper water habitat as they move into adult age classes. And <clears throat> in our region of the country, um, we are blessed with a, a great abundance of waters that provide great habitat for these. But again, almost anything that we do on our landscape has some detriment to them. So uh, urbanization, different forest practices, agricultural practices, large quantity water withdrawals, uh, climate change, of course, uh, you, yeah, it's a temperature thing. So when your, uh, you know, your air temperature goes up on average a couple of degrees, it changes your water temperature and we'll lose a whole bunch that are right at the, the thermal tolerance level for these fish, uh, not to mention different changes in flow regime and flooding frequency. Uh, and of course, dams um, and bad road stream crossings also block access to critical habitats for these fish. So while they're wonderful and highly enjoyed and utilized by people, they're very, very fragile. And they live in watersheds. So sort of uh, maybe a little uh, hokey of slides, but uh, uh, I wanted to establish the relationship between a watershed and, and a tree or really any dendritic system it can be a respiratory system there's uh, nerve cells that are the same way it's a common pattern but um, the headwaters of a watershed are really no different than the very small branches and the leaves of a tree uh, they are um, cumulatively the big the biggest part of it uh, they are where they interact with the land the most cumulatively it's where they get their water and their water quality issues their sediments from and so, you know, just the same as trying to manage a tree and, and, and basically ignoring all of the canopy and just managing for the trunk. Similarly, with watershed quality, the health of fisheries, there is no way that we can be successful managing for a healthy watershed without being able to have jurisdiction and to provide focus on those headwater systems. Those headwaters not only are the sources of the water and the sediment and create the nature of the downstream waters that we enjoy, but they also offer just fundamentally distinct habitats that, again, some of these fish species have to have to, to be able to flourish. So two of, two of the goals of the Clean Water Act, uh, first is uh, <clears throat> to, to basically eliminate the discharge of pollution, uh, pollutants into navigable waters by 1985. The second is, uh, it is the national goal that wherever attainable an interim goal of water quality, which provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, and provides for recreation in and on the water uh, be achieved by 1983. Now, the definitions of the waters of the U.S., uh, it's clear on interstate, navigable, well, navigable becomes cloudy sometimes, but uh, uh, waters that influence navigable or interstate waters, and that is these headwater streams. 
and that's where the uh, uh, the guidance that's been there and the, the past legal uh, history of this thing, this issue, has led to a lot of uncertainty and unclarity, or lack of clarity on which of these headwater streams would be included and which would not. So to give you an idea of the scope of what's at stake, um, these headwaters on this issue can kind of remain um, just a theoretical idea, but these are very specific waters, and we can and have mapped them and know where that they are. So I'm going to flip through a, a, a couple of slides of different Great Lakes states, and, and what you need to see is um, these are all color coded. So these are sub watersheds, and the lightest color is where zero to 25 percent of the stream miles in that sub watershed are made up of these waters to be affected here these headwater small streams and then as the color darkens that becomes increasing amounts of the stream mileage in the sub watershed to the point where uh, let's see just the, the medium orange color is 50 to 75 percent of the watershed so here's Michigan you can see that uh, this is you know clarifying and providing clarity on these waters is a very big deal very big deal Wisconsin perhaps more so uh, probably a larger uh, a larger in scope issue in Wisconsin Minnesota a little bit less but you can still see that in the southern part of the state is a very significant portion of the watersheds that would be affected in Illinois maybe the most um, you can get all of these maps for your own use or closer examination um, on the, the Trout Unlimited website, tu.org. You'll find it there. Therefore, um, most of the states across the country. So um, I'll leave you with one uh, paired set of pictures that can illustrate the, uh, uh, well, it is another way of illustrating the importance of having clarity, and I would say, the right clarity on whether these waters are protected or not. This is um, a picture of a stream that, through the lack of clarity, did not receive protections from the Clean Water Act, and through some oil and gas activities, went from looking like that to looking like that. I'll toggle back. That's the same barn, of course. So I'll stop there and pass it off to someone else. Great. Well, thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Um, next, uh, we are going to have um, uh, Gito Tori. He is the Dr public policy director for Ducks Unlimited in the Great Lakes region, which I apparently goes from what Minnesota, Dakota to Maine. So you figure Maine how that to Minnesota <laughs> to Maryland to Missouri. So. Exactly. So if that means Great Lakes. I don't know what does. Um, okay. Uh, Gito is actually a Michigan State undergrad, Ohio State master's degree, so I don't know who he rooted for um, this past weekend, but... Always a Spartan. Sports. Always a Spartan, okay. Gito Torrey. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, Brian gave you the uh, cold water fishery flavor. I'll give you the duck flavor, and they're both culinary delights. I uh, just want you to know that. So, um, And I, what I'm going to do today is kind of talk about um, what's Clean Water Act, uh, how it relates to wetland conservation, uh, what it means to wetland wildlife, and particularly waterfall. Talk a little bit about the Supreme Court decisions and how they have influenced you know, the current debate that we're in right now. And then talk a little bit about uh, science and the proposed rule that's coming up. So what's at stake in the 30 years um, that we've had the Clean Water Act, we've seen a, a dramatic slowing of wetland loss. But uh, still pretty significant. Since the 50s, we've lost over 17 million acres of wetlands in the United States. It's slowing, but it's, it's, it's still pretty significant. Um, when you look at uh, the Midwest and the Great Lakes, uh, you know, just about every state's lost almost 50%, and sometimes in, in some cases, uh, you know, upwards of 80, 90% of wetlands have been lost and a lot of those wetlands that have been lost have been the small wetlands the headwater wetlands that brian talked about and a lot of the uh, prairie potholes the vernal pools critical for uh, a lot of species of wildlife 
And when you look at threatened and endangered wildlife in many of our Great Lakes states, the majority of those that are threatened and endangered are wetland dependent. You know, makes sense. We've drained the wetlands, lost them, and uh, fish and wildlife suffer. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about isolated wetlands, and probably the best example of, of talking about them is using the prairie potholes. Um, you know, on the bottom right, you've got an uh, uh, intact, healthy prairie pothole system, all isolated. A lot of them are isolated. Some are connected. And you can see in the upper left what happens when you begin to drain those, and you have a series of interconnected ditches that pull those wetlands out. And... Uh, Fairly dramatically, uh, especially with the rise in crop prices here recently, um, you know, wetland loss rates have increased dramatically, 140 percent since 2004, um, and that's that's devastating. Um, and how devastating is it in Minnesota, uh, where there's been a 96 percent loss of wetlands in some of their prime farm country that used to be prime prairie pothole country? We've seen a 92 percent loss in duck production. Um, which is huge because migratory bird hunting is big business in this country. There's about 2.6 million Americans that, that participate. It's almost $70,000 70, jobs. A lot of those jobs are in rural, economy, or rural settings and rural economies. Uh, huge um, uh, sales and retail. I mean, duck hunters are addicts for the newest duck call, the newest decoy, so they spend a lot of money. And it's also a huge generation of sales tax revenue. So waterfall hunting and migratory bird hunting is big business, and it's dependent primarily on those isolated wetlands. So dwarfing even that is the impact of wildlife recreational observation. And um, over 20 million people that like to watch waterfowl and shorebirds and other wildlife with an uh, economic output of $9.8 billion. That is no small potatoes when it comes to our economy. We have not sold that very well as a conservation community, and we need to make sure our legislators and leaders understand that it's not just fun to go out and watch birds. It's not just fun and recreation to hunt. It's business, big business in our country. So let's back up. We had 30 years of the Clean Water Act that really, really worked well. I mean, Lake Erie was cleaned up for the first time. It still needs some help now. Um, and uh, the Cuyahoga River is cleaned up. A lot of great advancements. Rivers became more fishable, swimmable, drinkable. But back in, 19, in 2001, we had the Swank decision. It was a case out of Illinois where the sole purpose for jurisdiction was based on the migratory bird rule, which said if you wanted to see if it, something was protected under the Clean Water Act, if there was a presence of migratory birds there, that could be used to um, include as jurisdictional wetland, protected as jurisdictional wetlands. The Supreme Court overturned that. Um, and it was a poor case to be tested on. Um, it, was, it was a really unfortunate uh, decision. And then uh, later, there was the Rapanos Carabelle, which occurred right here in Michigan. Um, and uh, that was a, a split decision uh, by the court. And uh, uh, Senator, or Senator uh, Justice Kennedy, is, that's where he uh, came up with the term, um, you have to establish a significant nexus, or there was a significant nexus test, which meant there was some kind of connection between isolated wetlands or headwater wetlands and traditionally navigable waters. So some of his key points was, you know, the Corps could only ex ex exhibit uh, jurisdiction that was dependent upon a significant nexus or connection between the wetlands in question and tradi traditional navigable waters. And that significant nexus could include ecological factors such as flood control, waterfall, or wa water filtration, and habitat. And he also said that wetlands possess a, the requisite nexus if the wetlands, either alone or in combination with similarly situated lands in the region, significantly affect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of other covered waters and more readily understood as navigable. And, you know, those, that was a, a really good and wise comment. And I think it, it provided us some, some great guidance. However, 
practically on the ground, it raised a lot of questions and created a lot of uncertainty and, and a lack of clarity for the regulators to function. And hence, that's where we are now. Um, and another significant thing that he had to say was that um, this quote here that it may be well that in the absence of hydrologic connection that there is still a wetland significance to the aquatic system. And so that's where science really has to come in to kind of illuminate the decision making process. So what does the science say? And that's basically what what uh, Justice Kennedy left us with, you know, do the wetlands affect the rivers? Do the isolated potholes, the isolated wetlands affect the watershed? Um, and here's, a, you know, kind of a, a simplified uh, version of, of that, but, you know, in these isolated wetlands, you, you will get overland flow into those wetlands. And if those wetlands become too full, right now in Iowa, it has been raining and raining and raining. They're getting another five inches today. A lot of their drain potholes are full to the brim and they're overflowing and going into the river system and they've got major issues. So even though these isolated wetlands, you know, are isolated uh, during times of heavy rain events, they're not. They're connected. They're part of the navigable system. We also have the underground flow, the, uh, the groundwater flow that we know occurs. And a lot of these isolated wetlands even though they're not overland connected to, to rivers and streams, through the groundwater there is a recharge and a reflow of water. So, you know, what we need to do is a, a major education effort in, in getting our legislative leaders and regulators to understand the science that there, that there is a connection. And then there's also the problem of what happens when we drain these isolated wetlands. And here's a, an example of a rivering uh, system and you have isolated wetlands in the watershed you can see the the darker green boundary of the watershed and so let's say uh, a landowner starts to drain in these wetlands and of course the way he's going to drain them is tile them or ditch them to the nearest waterway right so what what does that do to that stream course it increases the stream flow and velocity and amount of water going through there so you have all kinds of issues being raised by draining those potholes. You're putting more water in the system. You're increasing the speed of drainage, the erosion, in-stream erosion, and causing major issues. And you've also expanded the watershed. And now the more you drain, the faster that water's coming out, the more volume is coming out, and it's causing downstream impacts to landowners. So there is a connection between how we conserve and, and, and regulate isolated wetlands and the impact on navigable waters. So what are the hydro hydrological results? You go from that to this to that. More flood for less rain. And we see examples of this all over the place. Not just in the Mississippi River, uh, the city of Detroit uh, a couple weeks ago. Flooding in the streets. And everybody thinks, well, our pumping stations aren't working fast enough. No, you've removed all your wetlands and your storage from your landscape and you're just jamming it in a small place quicker and uh, it's causing floods. In, in the Mississippi River floods in 1993, over 16 billion dollars in damages and when you look at where the water was coming from, it was come from states that lost you know basically 90 percent of their wetlands. No place for the water to go. All the isolated wetlands that we care about for ducks and other species um, are gone and those those waters are running right into the rivers and causing major flooding and major economic damage. You also have water quality issues where you have wetlands that can slow that water down, clarify the water, process the nitrogen and phosphorus, and uh, we remove those wetlands and we come up with situations like this that increase the sediment loads and create waters that uh, look like the one on the left. And um, the same thing we've seen in Chesapeake Bay, you know, water going through these wetland systems are filtering the uh, nitrogen and Im improving water quality. And it's definitely an issue right here at home in Western Lake Erie Basin. And um, it was kind of interesting, I, for this talk I was trying to get a handle on what is the percent loss in the Maumee River Basin that feeds uh, Lake Erie, and obviously it's the biggest contributor to Lake Erie. And um, we don't have those figures. We don't know how many wetlands we've lost in the Maumee River Basin watershed by, by the, the big category of the watershed or sub-watersheds. 
Um, we need to understand that because wetlands are a critical factor in reducing phosphorus and nitrogen loads uh, into major water bodies. I, and you know, one of the other categories in these Supreme Court decisions was the other waters category, and um, it might be a little hard to see, but you know, you have a navigable waterway, and then you have adjacent wetlands that, under the current version of the Clean Water Act, are are jurisdictional, and then you have uh, floodplain wetlands, which are jurisdictional. But then you have this category of other wetlands, wetlands that are up in the watershed, outside, maybe outside of the floodplain, um, and how are they connected? And uh, when you look at the bigger picture, this is that's what we were looking at. Those other waters are there, and you know, from a science-based standpoint, all those wetlands are connected through either groundwater or in times of high rainfall events and impact those navigable waters. So we need, to, we need to share that science and get that out, and that's what DU has been doing here in preparation for the October 20th comment period, is get that science out before EPA to get those other waters and isolated wetlands included. And you know, when it comes to people caring about water, I mean, we've heard a lot about it already this, this, this day, but when you poll people, you know, a lot of folks believe that we have too few wetlands, more than too many and high, high levels of public sentiment in protecting wetlands. In many states right now, water quality, drinking water quality is the highest and most important environmental issue that people care about. Uh, even in Indiana, huge, strong uh, farming economy, 89% thought that improving water quality was important. So time and time again, we hear the public saying water quality is important, importance of wetlands, the science shows that, we, that it's there, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to express that wetlands and abundant clean water mean a lot to us and are critical for our livelihoods. Make sure that the agencies have the best available science. Demonstrate how the science supports significant nexus between wetlands and other jurisdictional wetlands waters. It's not an easy concept. A lot of people don't, don't want to grasp it. Um, uh, DU is pushing strongly to make sure that potholes and some other categories of isolated wetlands are included in the new rule. Right now, they're not in that new rule. So we're, we're not exactly crazy about the rule. We, we, need, we want it to include more. And then, of course, um, we have to support protection and clarification of long-standing exemptions for farming and ranching. Um, if we don't, we're, we're going to be, be dead in the water. And we're almost dead in the water right now because of what's going on in Congress right now. And what's going on in, right, right now in Congress today is not a Republican deal. Um, just got a note from... Uh, Colin Peterson, our congressman from Minnesota, who said, we got to pass this, this, this uh, new law to, to stop the clean water rule from moving forward. It's, it's an educational effort we need to do with our legislators. They need to understand the science. They need to instand, understand the importance um, to us for our livelihoods, for our recreation, and for that economy reason I mentioned earlier. So we need to keep this from becoming this and ensuring that. So, thank you. Well, thanks, Gito. So, building off of what Gito had said in terms of where we are now, um, let me just get my last slide up here. Before we get into um, how, what, what can we do, I want to give you guys a sense of what we're up against and what I would characterize as two main obstacles. Um, one, being uh, Congress, uh, and as Judo uh, rightly said, it's not Republican or, or Democrat. This is this is both both parties are responsible, at least in the House of Representatives, for uh, getting in the way of. And it's not just a clean water uh, rule. This happened with other rules that EPA has, has been moving forward to uh, on. So this is not a surprise to see this. Um, but what you all can do is is is, um, is to advocate. Uh, to have Congress to step aside and let EPA do its job. So Congress is one of the main obst obstacles. And as, as I think around 5 o'clock today is, is when this vote would, would be scheduled. And the House bill, I think, is... Uh, 5078. 5078, isn't it? 5078, yes. H.R. 5078. And as you guys know, the House, is it, they, they can do their part, but they have the Senate has to uh, do its well, its part as well, and then obviously the president has to sign a law. So this is really a, we know it's not going to move forward. 
So it's a purely a symbolic gesture on the House of Representatives to to really stop the EPA from doing the science and helping clarify uh, some of the science. That's the number one obstacle. Number two obstacle is what I would consider misinformation. Let me read you this quote. This administration's EPA, uh, this administration's um, EPA has demonstrated once again its desire to go around congressional and court intent with the proposed Waters of the U.S. Blank, blank. This 371 page rule might as well be written in farmer's blood. If implemented as it now stands, the Waters of the U.S. rule could bring an end to farmers as farming as you know it. Now, as we, you heard from Gito, as you heard from Brian, that this could not be further from the truth. But this is the type of rhetoric that is getting in the hands and the offices of a lot of these people in Congress. And so, and as I was talking to Karen Hobbs earlier, never before have we seen our own federal government have to come up with a myth-busting fact sheet that looks at how can we you know, um, move past all this misinformation and really get to the facts. And so this was designed specifically on EPA's website to tell the truth of what are some of the things that, are, that the Farm Bureau is demonstrating in its rhetoric to members of Congress that are simply just not true. You know, anything from the Clean Water Act regulating mud puddles to golf courses to, uh, you know, water dripping from your gutter. We've heard it all. And EPA had to go and take its time to, to do this. And, and essentially, this is, this is out of the ordinary. Um, but this, this shows you what we're up against. So I am going to steal a story that Gito tells. And you probably might have heard it, whether in receptions or, or in the car with Gito, if you know Gito. Yeah. So uh, a couple years ago, during the Clean Water Restoration Act, there there's a bill that was moving through Congress that basically would do what this rule is trying to do, re-clarify what the Clean Water Act intent was. And you were meeting with Dingle. Congressman Dingle, a uh, champion from Ann Arbor, my congressman, um, right at, uh, to talk about why this, this bill should go forward. Right after him, as he left the room, the Farm Bureau, Michigan Farm Bureau, was coming in to meet with Dingle on the same exact bill. And they were with some spouses um, in the hallway, and, and Gito finally said, what are you, where, where are you guys on this position, on this bill? And I said, well, we're against it. And then Gito said, do you guys know that this bill has exemptions for almost um, all agriculture practices, almost all as you see here? And the wife of one of the members punches... <laughs> She hit him with the bill. Hit him with the bill and says, I told you you should have read the bill before you went and started listening with the Farm Bureau has to say. So it's, it's a, it's, so we sh I share that with you to laugh, also to share with you that this is just clear misinformation. So as we talk about what this, this rule will do, um, we have to be armed with the facts. Because if you go in to any member of Congress and you provide misinformation, it's, that's, that's never a good thing. So. What I thought what we do is, what are opportunities that are happening now that you all can play a role in? Now, a lot of you guys know that, as I said before, there's a bill today. If you get out of this workshop, if you haven't already done it, go call your congressperson and let them know to vote against this bill, 5078, um, and let EPA do its job. Quite simple message. And if you've already done that, thank you. The second thing is a lot of the groups that are part of the Healing Our Waters Coalition have already signed on to a dear or a letter uh, um, that was going to Congress basically talking about how this bill is not a good idea and that um, we support clean water. A lot of the Clean Water, the clean water Act is actually the, the bedrock for a lot of the progress we're seeing in the Great Lakes with the GLRI. We don't want to see that undermined. Uh, so that's an opportunity. You can also, as Gito referenced, the public comment period to EPA is still open. The deadline, I think, is October 20th, but we're relatively sure that's going to be extended. Um, please comment on that. We received, I think, almost, I think EPA's received almost over, a little bit over 600,000 comments so far. We would like to see that at a million. So, uh, you know, I think that's very similar with what I think the Clean Water Act uh, carbon rule got. It was over a million, a million comments. So take, do your part. Through your organizations, create action alerts um, and work with your membership to actually, and, in the, in the, and if you're not a part of an organization, work with your volunteers, your, your mom, your, your uncle, your, your sister, whoever it is. The more, the more, the merrier. And the one thing I will say about comments, um, the federal government is starting to do this. Well, they haven't started. They've been doing this for quite a long time. A lot of groups are putting out these form template action alerts. And if you sign your name to that and don't change any of the substance of that comment, they will consider that as one looped, loop all those comments together as one. So it's really, 
in essence, what they're doing is you might have 500 million comments with a name on the bottom that is the same. They're considering that one comment. So if you can tailor your message to Congress in any shape or form, uh, is, is always the best thing to do. I know we're really busy, uh, li li really busy lies, but if you can tell her that message, you'll, you'll kind of get through that bureaucratic hurdle. Um, the other thing is meet with your uh, local newspaper, meet with your uh, editorial boards. Editorial boards especially are really powerful messengers. Uh, I think more people read the editorials in the paper than the, in the, in the traditional um, articles that come in on a daily basis. Um, and just simply talk about the facts and, 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 and talk about why clean water is important, not only to your Great Lakes, uh, but for all the progress we're making. Um, and lastly, like I said, Chad Lord is, um, is hosting a uh, kind of a call-in um, session tomorrow where you can call your legislator. It, it was originally, before we knew the vote was happening today, we were going to do it to uh, do uh, in advance of the vote, but now the vote has been moved up. So Chad's session tomorrow will really be an opportunity for you either to thank or spank uh, your member of Congress on what they uh, he or she did on their vote. So stay tuned for that. It's in your program. Um, and so so stay, stay, stay tuned on, on how you can take part in that. So that will be a really informative, interactive session on that. So with that, we're done. Um, unless we want to do a Q&A. Um, we're we'll open up the questions. Yes. Um, Jill Beth, I'm with the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Um, and I know one thing that we've been dealing with lately is um, it seems like a lot of the farming groups have been saying, well, just the EPA should just put out a map. Just put out a map, show us what all these waters are. Um, the problem we have when we're trying to talk to legislators then is describing why that's not a possibility. And then you start getting into a lot of details and their eyes glaze over and they're not interested in so what's your go-to response for that to kind of comment? Like, why can't they put on a map? Chance? <laughs> well, part of the problem is that when it comes to farms and the lands that are on farms, the responsible agency for overseeing what goes on on the, on the property is USDA. And then the ones that are the ones responsible for regulating wetlands and use of wetlands is um, EPA and the Corps of Engineers. So automatically you've got different federal, federal agencies overseeing what happens on a landowner's land. Um, and I know that uh, NRCS did a lot of wetland determinations back in 85 Farm Bill, yeah. And uh, a lot of that hasn't been updated, so there's delinquency in terms of, you know, what are jurisdictional wetlands on on lands um, so uh, i also know that uh, there is the fish and wildlife service is doing some updates on the national wetland inventory du has been really involved with that in the great lakes areas here um, and i don't know if there's a mechanism for that federal agency to update the other agency so there there's some probably some bureaucratic reasons as well but it, that are preventing that from happening I just my my best guess unless anybody else has more insight well for the streams I mean we, we've done them for cold water watersheds um, you know there's some technical details in there obviously but uh, there, there are maps and that was our answer to those questions so um, you need help getting at least what we have for Minnesota in your hands be glad to help Jill's got a response I think yeah Jill in Minnesota, we're having a lot of trouble with groundwater depletion, so uh, well intervention. Uh, southwest part of the state is now having to pull water out of the Missouri River. Seems like we ought to be able to come up with some form of information on that level, too, about how important these are for recharging groundwater and trying to keep our aquifers in place so that there's water there for the farms that they're irrigating. Well, there's there's major groundwater issues going on in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota and the Ogallala Aquifer and um, I don't think the Clean Water Act deals with groundwater. Um, no, the Clean Water Act deals so, with surface water so, and navigable waters. So, but, yeah, but uh, having said that. 
Having said that, there yeah, is a connection, yeah, obviously, yeah. Um, um, between <laughs> between groundwater and 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 and, and surface water. So, actually, the Great Lakes Compact actually mm-hmm. was one of the first um, now laws that actually recognized that and said that they're one entity. They're, it's one system. So, um, how that relates with how we uh, provide protections under the Clean Water Act is is a different story. So. Well, I think on your point, Jill, and I'll say as we're, you know, there, there's been, you know, what happened in, in Toledo with the, with the water situation there um, and where we know that we're, uh, pollutants are coming from, from agriculture runoff, what, one of the things that we're really trying to do, NWF and DU and TU and a lot of the groups, and I mean most of the groups that, we, that work on this, is really trying to bring farmers to the table. Um, and, and we know that we need to have them at the table to provide the solutions. I mean, there's going to be some bad actors, but you know, almost 75% to 80% of farming, uh, the farming community is doing the right thing or doing good things. And so we need to, uh, obviously it's not enough. And so we need to enhance that. So, you know, part of the problem, part of the solution is, is, is incorporating them into the discussion um, and educating them. And, and, and as I said, the Farm Bureau is one of their primary messengers to the farming community and as you can see they're not getting the right information and so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's inherent upon us to provide that information as we see fit to the farming community um, groups like ducks unlimited um, and some of the like pheasants forever some of the, the the wildlife groups have really good connections with the farming community um, so if you have a connection with those those groups in particular among others i would really uh, really encourage you to reach out to them as a messenger uh, on your behalf to the farming community because we really need them at the table to help provide solutions. I'll run back. Yes, sir. If the EPA proposed rule really includes all those exclusions for agriculture, then why is it that Farm Bureau is so adamant against it? What's their argument? Change. I mean, it's it's the fear of anything that could be uh, another burden upon um, their, their clients, which is the farming community. Um, I don't know if I have the best answer. Maybe Gita, you can help me. Brian chime in here as well. But my 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 response is that um, they don't want anything that could be anywhere near the regulatory arm coming down on them. So there's a fear of that. So they feel it's a small sli- it would be a slippery slope for them to uh, allow something like the, this this rule to go forward because um, then they would say what's next. So that's that's my uh, interpretation as in the, in the simplest way. I don't know, Gito or Brian. Yeah, usually the you know I, from what I've seen in the past, it's uh, you know uh, a good offense is your best defense, and um, they you know they draw lines and stick to their guns so that they don't see an erosion of their their flexibilities. Uh, just, uh, yes, sir. I I belong to the Farm Bureau, but I used to be uh, county's uh, environmental mm-hmm. chairman. I'm no longer their environmental chairman. Uh, but the big scale they got is they think this law now is going to connect and include all the ditches in the front yard, the ditches next to the driveway. And I, I emailed uh, Action Alert, I think in the BC, the Southern Water County's uh, division. And I got the one feedback from the chairman of the one district is that. It's going to include ditches and more ways, so we can't really promote this. So I want to back some more information about exactly what the bill contains, and he's changed his mind. Mm-hmm. Because these farmers do not, they don't want, first of all, you're right, they don't want to be regulated by anyone. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the primary goal. Right. Uh, and they don't realize, they, they want to use every piece of ground for crops. So they are no repairing areas, they don't want a wetland, they can resolve a lot of this by just putting detention basins on their property. Wetlands? Wetlands, yeah. yeah. Wetlands. <laughs> so they don't want to do it. But they're scared that it includes ditches. That's their main scare. Right. Not good input. Karen? Just one other comment on that. I think, well, the Farm Bureau has made this their 
reason for being. Mm -hmm. You know, groups like the Farmers Union, mm -hmm. well, the, at the national level, the National Farmers Union initially came out and said this was an ag friendly clarification. They kind of backed away from that nationally. But local state state based farmers unions, like the Michigan Farmers Union, the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, they support the law and they support this clarity. And you know, the farmer was one of the groups who was advocating for EPA before to clarify, you know, just two years ago. So now that they're trying to clarify something, they're against it again. So I think this is why are they opposed? That's really the million dollar question. Yeah. And, and actually, in, in working on some of the messaging stuff, we've seen some similarities in op-eds and, and uh, editorials coming from uh, both the ag community and other industries that would be more affected by this, such as mining interests, oil and gas mm. Uh, mm. builders. And so there's obviously some coordination going mm -hmm. on, and there's probably a strategic decision made that farmers were made the best messengers at this point, and they're going to put them up front. And so I, I suspect that it's in their farmers' interest, but there's also obviously some strategic uh, some strategy going on from other communities that are part of it. Sure. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Janina Douglas, Lake Erie Improvement Association. What about insurance companies? You make the point of you know the devastation caused by you know these changes and somebody's paying the bill and I realize it's the US taxpayer in the end. But Insurance companies are certainly hard hit when these things hit. So are they lobbying Congress and saying, "Hey, how can we do something about this?" Oh, I don't. I don't know if they're lobbying Congress, but. Um DU has reached out to um, some of the flood insurers, the uh, major flood insurers in the uh, in the country, and um, tried to find some common ground because of, you know, we've got some pretty good data where, you know, the increase in floods, the increase in hundred year floods are now every you know ten years, and and the impacts to local communities and, and of course the payouts by insurance companies, and so we've started some conversations with them, um, haven't gotten really far yet, but I think those are economic drivers that can help shape the discussion and future negotiation um, so a good point uh, another another thing that, that we're facing is you know a lot of this is fear but a lot of this is lack of trust between citizens and government um, and very much a big part of that and um, I think it might be driving us to a new form of governance if you will where um, if this thing doesn't go anywhere, and we're still going to have uncertainty, and, and everybody, even the the farmers and the Chamber of Commerce, have asked for more clarity in in wetland regulation. But so it, as this goes forward, it, it may need to be more of a collaborative exercise to develop a new clean water rule, rather than government coming up with a rule or guidance and then saying, "Here, what do you guys think?" I think it's going to have to be more of a collaborative process because. Right now, the, the lack of trust between you know, citizens and, and our government is at an all-time high. So I think that's having a major impact. Well, as you deliberate your questions, one, one thing I'll <clears throat> add is in, in terms of the messengers that are getting the word out, there's obviously there's, there's groups like the Healing Our Waters Coalition, you know, all the coalitions across the country, like you know, Chesapeake, Everglades, are doing similar outreach that you're doing. Uh, we're there. NWF and TU and and um, and and uh, Ducks Unlimited and uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, particularly, are pulling together a a, a hunting and angling uh, uh, a coalition of groups to to encourage uh, members of Congress to um, stay out of it and and promote the rule. So that's that's the, from the sportsman's perspective uh, side of things. Gito talked about the outdoor ec economy, huge, uh, and it's and a lot of that is based upon uh, this rule and and the Clean Water Act and and protecting those uh, wetlands and streams. So that's an important constituency um, that uh, needs to continue to do that. Karen mentioned the farmers union. If you guys have connections or soil and water districts, uh, if you have connections with those type of entities in your state. Um, really reach out to them because they are good messengers. Um, that would be a nice trifecta of the environmental, the outdoor economy with the hunting and angling community, and the actual private landowners who are actually um, really on the ground um, at, uh, at the forefront. So those are the type of outreach um, uh, strategies that are that are, are very helpful. Um, and you know, this is going to see. We're 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 not sure how long the comment period will probably be extended for, and and when they will actually finalize this thing. 
Um, but uh, we hope that it is, is done in a way that uh, uses the science that Gito had talked about and that Brian talked about to really in inform policy. And that, that's what's important here. The science has to inform the policy um, in order for us to, to, to move forward. So any other questions? Please time to call people. Yeah, yeah. So now you have time to go call your member of Congress and tell them to vote no. Uh, the, the vote's only in, what, 20 minutes, supposedly. So um, if there's no other questions, again, thank you. Uh, Gito, Brian, and I will be around um, throughout the conference. If you have questions about specifically what you can do um, to help play a role, uh, we'd be happy to entertain those. But if, so thank, thank you. you.